There we are. Hello. It's great to see you all um, this, this morning, and I hope that we're going to enjoy the service together. Listen to these words um, from the book of Isaiah, and, and, and in chapter 40, Isaiah can be quite a, a heavy book because it's full of all sorts of, you know, warnings, and you kind of read this and think, oh, this is getting a bit, a bit heavy. And then in chapter 40, the, the, the whole tone of this fascinating prophecy changes, and it starts off with those well-known words, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. And then, right at the end, there is a passage where the writer, or God, says, to whom, to whom will you compare me, says the Lord. All right. Now, the challenges that Israel had been facing were enormous. In fact, they were in exile. Jerusalem had been destroyed, and most, if not all, the Jews had been taken prisoner and sent into a foreign country. And they weren't happy there. And some of them became, most of them became extremely discouraged. When you're a long way from home, do you know that feeling? When you're a long way from home, and all you want to do is just get back home. But it seems an impossible mission. And so, and so they became very introspective. And God constantly encourages them and he says, to whom, to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Lord. Lift up your eyes. Now hear that one. Lift up your eyes. How often do we not hear those words? I will Lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Remember that one? I will lift up my eyes. So often our eyes are cast inwardly. And we're terribly introspective. And it all just at times seems to get the better of us. And then the psalmist in 121 says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And now Isaiah, or the Lord himself speaking through Isaiah says, to whom will you compare me, says God? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Do that tonight if it's a clear night. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? That's the question. So tonight, do that. And hear God say, wherever you may be, lift up your eyes. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and might, not one of them is missing. So why do you say, O Israel, says God, why do you say, O Israel, and complain, O Jacob, my ways are hidden from the Lord. Have you not known, have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not grow tired and weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. So, have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. He will not grow tired or weary 
and his understanding no one can fathom. And hear this. Because here is a word that we really, really need to hear. In particular, a younger generation. He, he gives strength to the weary. And increases the power of the weak. A lot of people are just throwing in the towel and saying, I'm out of South Africa. I'm gone. I am gone. I'm sick and tired. Not just younger people, but many others. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. You know what happens next? You know what's coming up? But those who... Wait, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will rise on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Now, I'm committed to telling that story and proclaiming that message for the remainder of my life. We believe and trust and place our hope in a God of hope. And when you feel like throwing in the towel, and it's not just the older generation, it's younger ones as well these days. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall but those who hope those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength they will soar what a wonderful wonderful picture they will soar dear Lord help us to soar they will soar on wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Now, if you just come to church to hear that, then you can go home now. All right? We'll take the offering. <laughs> If you've just needed to hear that today, Isaiah chapter 40, 40, the very last verses of Isaiah chapter 40. Go home, get your Bibles out, get the message out, the NIV out, the NLT out, all the different editions. See how they express them. They all are translations and they express it slightly differently, which is fascinating. Isaiah 40, the last verses, that before you walk up and get out, let's sing, <laughs> let's sing quietly, I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses, all right? We come to meet with God here, not just to hear some sermon, we come to meet with with the Lord. Lord, we thank you that we are together today. It's a magnificent Sunday morning. And we're here gathered as a group of Christian men and women. Perhaps some of us are just curious. We may not identify ourselves as Christians, but it was important that we be here just to find out what it's all about. We thank you that we can meet with you in this place. Yes, of course, we can meet you in the Ferncloof Mountains. We can meet you on Grotto Beach. We can meet you on the cliff path in the beauty and quietness of a colorful garden. But there's something special about us being here today 
with your people, family, friends, the body of Christ, together. We may not know each other terribly well, but we understand, Lord, that there is a bond, a deep bond between us, because we profess faith and love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us. You have blessed us. We are surrounded by beauty. We are loved and we have the privilege of loving. God, we thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for all that you have done for us in your son Jesus in opening our eyes and ears and discerning something deeper, something more beautiful, something that causes our hearts to rise up and our eyes to be lifted up towards you, our God. We thank you for the gift of a Savior who has been amongst us and is amongst us, quickening us, strengthening us, comforting us, challenging us, sometimes even disturbing us. But you love us and you want us to grow. You want us to be more like you. And Lord, that is our desire, to be more like you, to be Christian men and women whose lives have been transformed by the power of God at work within us, the Holy Spirit. And our time together is a meeting with you. Take us up into your presence. Give us a focus. We might spend this hour looking truly unto Jesus. Strengthen us. Forgive us. Lord, we're not proud of the things we do and say at times. Instead of words of life and hope, we speak words of hurt and sometimes we inflict damage on others God forgive us give us hearts that are truly beautiful that our lives our words our tongues will speak words of encouragement and not cursing but thank you for your gift to us, undeserving men and women, bountiful, merciful, gracious God, we thank you. We thank you. Worship is such an important part of our lives. It's an opportunity for us to, to become not preoccupied with ourselves, but preoccupied with God. You know, when you take the Greek word for worship, proskuneo, it means literally, I come towards to kiss. All right? I come towards to kiss. That's what worship is. Yeah. In the old marriage service, you remember, with this ring, remember the old vows, with this ring I thee do wed, with my body I thee do worship. Isn't that lovely? With this ring I thee do wed, with my body I thee do worship. That is so beautiful. And we worship the Lord. It's something that engages every part of us, our minds, our hearts. And many of you express that in bodily movement. And that is just 
altogether lovely. It kind of lifts us, lifts us from too much internal gazing as we turn our eyes, our being, our souls, reach out. I will lift up mine eyes. Look to the heavens, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Worship is an act of offering. Uh, I, I, I honor you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. So, in the evening services, we've been looking at the book of Acts, and I think it has awakened for many of us a real, a particular interest once more in that extraordinary book, the book of Acts. Jesus has ascended. He says, I'm going to be with you. I am going to be with you. And then on the day of Pentecost, we have a sort of a return of Jesus, except that it's a spiritual presence, and people's lives are A, transformed, and B, they are strengthened. And they, and they live their lives. And it wasn't easy. It really, really wasn't easy. You see that movie, and when you've read the movie, you know, you come back to it and you begin to see things that perhaps you hadn't seen before. Just how much pressure those early Christians were under. I mean, they must have had a deep, deep experience of God, the Holy Spirit, to have been willing to take on the kind of pressure and persecution that will seem to be part of it. Um, and one is just filled with admiration. It starts in Jerusalem. And Jesus had said, you know, you're going to be my disciples and my witnesses in Jerusalem and, and so on. And, and how did that spreading out take place? Except they were people on the run. They were under pressure, and after a while it got too much for them in Jerusalem, so they had to go, and they fled. Just that they didn't leave their faith in Jerusalem. They took it with them. And wherever they went, it was just as natural as breathing that they would be Christians or believers or followers of the way, which was how it came to be known. These are followers of the way, that is, Jesus as the way. And slowly but surely, planting seeds, moving into communities, very small, very small, very small, and slowly this begins to grow. Just a seed that gets planted, and you think, oh, how feeble, how small, how insignificant. My goodness. And from there it began to, to grow. But I, I want to read a, a, a few verses from, from uh, Acts chapter 11, where, where, where the gospel reaches a town called Antioch in Syria. Acts chapter 11. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen. Remember, Stephen had been martyred. Those who had been scattered by the... And, and who led the persecution? You remember? Saul. The great Saul, or Saul who was soon to be the uh, Paul. And we read there, early on, that, that Saul soon to be Paul, ravaged the church. He ravaged. He was enemy number one. And you can imagine, after his conversion, and they said, one guy in particular says, it gets a message from God and says, you know, Saul is going to come knocking on your door. Please welcome him. And he says, excuse me, <laughs> you know, like, excuse me? Who are you talking? You mean like Saul? You know, of, yeah. Don't be afraid. You want to see what's happened to him. And in comes Saul, and he's blind. He's been, he, he has met Jesus, and the light of God has just 
taken his sight away. It does come back. But Saul was, was enemy number one as far as the Christians were concerned. But anyway, the persecution goes on. And they traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus. Cyprus. Some went across the sea to Cyprus and to Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. And some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, that's crossing North Africa, went to, An went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus, telling them about the good news. I like that. Our faith is good news. And how is it? What is good in your faith? You know, what, what do you really enjoy? Somebody comes to you, I've got good news for you, and you up go your ears. You've got good news for me. And, and, and somebody will tell you about something that may have happened. It's good news. I had my daughter in, Kath Ashley, in from Harvard this week. Oh, man, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. We had three wonderful, wonderful days. Ate Woolies fish there on earth. Opened a bottle of wine each evening. We just sat and we had talks into late into the night. Mwah. And I was sad when I saw her driving away. Kind of, oh, see her at Christmas. Love you lots, my darling. You know. And now a little, oh, you know, but I'll get you soon. But it was such good news. You're looking for good news. Something, and now I hear people talking about the good news of the Lord Jesus. Now, how is Jesus or the Lord Jesus good news for you? I mean, think about that one. How is it good news? You're not going to become a Christian if it's seriously bad. So think through your faith. Because the moment we lose our capacity to share our faith as good news, then I'm afraid I will throw in the towel. And so how is it good news? Now, one understands for the Jewish folk, it, it was good news for many reasons. I mean, it was good news that Jesus was the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah. And, and that represented so so much to them as Jews rooted in this expectation of a Messiah. And, and their hearts were filled with joy. They knew that the Messiah had come, although that was perhaps one of the reasons why they'd been persecuted, because the majority of the Jewish community didn't think the Messiah had come. But they looked at their lives and they just saw this enormous change that had happened. The hopes and fears of all the years as we sing in that Christmas carol, O come, O come, Emma, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Good news. How is Jesus good news? Some might say, you know what? I have always a deep sense of his presence with me. He's alive. He said, I will never leave you. That is good news. And I have been sustained by a sense of his strengthening hand. The good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He is good news. And I want to share this with you. It's not a thumb suck. It's not some delusional way of looking at life. It is a deep spiritual reality. Good news. Oh, he has forgiven me. Peter, messing up, messing up on that night when Jesus was betrayed and he denied Jesus. He cursed about Jesus. I don't know the man. Can you imagine the despair in Peter's heart? Unimaginable. And then, after the resurrection, Peter, Peter, come here. Do you love me? He didn't say, you little son. You're out of this, boy. You're out of this. Did he say? No. Pete, 
Peace, bro. Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times. Do you love me? Uh, you know. And, and I felt embarrassed, <laughs> but he was probably never more relieved to have that question asked of him. And he sat back later in his life and he thought that was a defining moment. He loves me. He forgives me. Ah, oh, the stories could go on. Wow, Jesus is good news. Good news. In the face of death, there is something who walks that journey with you when you've had to say goodbye to your dearest and you say goodbye and know that she hasn't gone or he or whoever it is hasn't gone alone. I am the living one. I was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore and I hold the keys. So we set out on that journey. I am the resurrection and the life man, that woman who places their trust and hope in me though they be dead yet shall they live. That's good news of the Lord Jesus. That's what they were sharing with the Greek folk. Telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. In a society where Caesar was Lord we've seen that on that DVD. The autocratic kind of all-consuming and all power that belonged to Caesar. Yet you did not dare cross Caesar. And the Christians said no. It's not Caesar. Jesus is Lord. And in a time, a society it was very unpredictable be able to say it, Jesus is Lord. Now that is an anchor of the soul. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. The good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. When we offer a world good news about the Lord Jesus, yes, of course, they're going to be scoffers. Yes, they're going to say, oh, my goodness gracious, here comes the God squad. Or oh, whatever, you know, my grand, my mom, they're Christian. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. It's going to happen. Paul at Athens, they scoffed at him. They thought, oh my goodness. You know, what's this guy smoking? And, but there were always those gathered. So, well, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Let's listen to him. Let's listen a little more carefully. And they did. They did. And here in Antioch, the Lord hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So what is good news? What is it? It's good news. Somebody says why are you a Christian? Are you perhaps able just to turn the conversation to say well let me tell you a few things. Are you or is it you know, I'm not sure yet. No, don't be ashamed. Just speak and think and articulate for yourself, perhaps first. How is Jesus good news? And not everybody, but some will want to hear more. So the story continues. News of this astonishing these astonishing things at Antioch reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem. All right? And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Barnabas. Now, Barnabas appears earlier on in the book of Acts. His name was um, Joseph. 
He was a Levite. He was from Cyprus. But they gave him the name Barnabas, which means, you know, son of encouragement. Now, what a magnificent title. Name that was. It was like a nickname. Hey, Barney. You know what? They saw this man in action, Joseph the Levite from old Cyprus, you know. But we're going to call him Barnabas because wherever he goes, he's not tearing down people. He's not criticizing people. He is encouraging them. Encouraging them. Getting alongside of them. And just saying, guys, well done. Let's move forward. This is brilliant. And they so enjoyed Barnabas, one of the magnificent characters of the New Testament. Are you a, an encourager? A church needs lots of Barnabases. Are you an encourager? Are you somebody who gets alongside of people and says, go for it, well done, well done. Well done. Building people are up. Or are you perhaps always the one who's putting people down? May I say this? For Jesus' sake, stop that. Pulling people down, criticizing, gossiping, all the other nonsense that is totally alien to the spirit of Jesus. Totally alien. Let a man or a woman be taken hold of by Christ. And they don't look down their noses. Whoop, no. You know. Encouragement. This is Barnabas. And the word comes back to the church in Jerusalem. Hey guys, something going on at Antioch. We need to go and check it out. Check this out. And who do they send except Barnabas? Wonderful. Wonderful. And when he arrived... He saw the evidence of the grace of God and he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Isn't that a magnificent description? No? Yeah. Guys, I mean, we're talking about a guy here. So let me ask first. Guys, guys, could this be said of you? All right? Here comes, here you come. Look, here comes dad. You know, here comes my husband, says your wife. Here comes dad, says your children. Or here comes opa, say the grandchildren. Or here comes, you know, Barnabas, who lives, you know, here comes into the golf club or whenever. And in their minds... They're saying, gosh, he's a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. I say, oh, Lord Jesus, just, may that be a description of us guys, a good guy, a good man, full, full of the Holy Spirit. I don't come preaching, you know, okay, full of the Holy Spirit, full of grace and truth, the fruit of the Spirit in abundance. Here comes my husband. I can't wait for him to walk in that door. Here comes my dad. Here comes Opa. Here comes my friend. Or even if you don't, you don't know, here comes a guy and you just respect him because he is a good man and he is full of faith. He's full of the Holy Spirit. I say, Lord, give us such guys. Give us such guys. Give us more men like Barnabas. And it's little wonder, you know, it's little wonder that a great number of people were brought to the Lord because that kind of guy was present in the church. And Barnabas comes and he sees the evidence, he sees the evidence of the grace of God. He's, now, what, what would you think would be evidence of the grace of God? If somebody comes to United, 
Right? The evidence of the grace of God. What would they experience? They kind of come to the church, maybe not once, but over a period of time, and they say, you know, I see the grace of God. What do you think they would have experienced there? I, I mean, you answer that. That's, you answer that one. Would they, would they would see in a community like Antioch people who they had known previously and <laughs> You know, Paul was going to visit there. They saw the likes of Paul. You know, who's that? This is, but they would have seen you. Really? They would have seen a transform, transformed lives. They would have seen transformed lives. They would have seen Christ-centered lives. You know what also they, I think they would see? They'd see. <coughs> they'd meet a friendliness. A friendliness. In a church where the evidence of the grace of God, a real friendliness. Now let me say, friendliness. Yeah, somebody said to me this week, your church is not friendly. Your church is not friendly. And you know what? That's how they experienced it. I can't say, well, you know, you were sitting in the wrong place if you'd been sitting in, you know, amongst there, you know, next this little group, and you would have had a terrific time with, you know, the second row or so. You know, people gather and they sit in the same place Sunday by Sunday. Some people walk in, they don't know where they go, they come down the aisle, a little bit awkward. Where do I sit? And nobody speaks to them, and they go, or whatever it is. And I remember one lady swallow. She spoke to me, I bumped into her in one of these shops. She said, James, I've been coming to the church for 12 years when I come out to Hermanus. Only one person has spoken to me, and that's Danny. Only one person, 12 years. Come in, and Danny is the one who speaks to them. So, well done, Foot. <laughs> yeah. Amen, Danny. That's evidence of the grace of God. Evidence of the grace of God. What, what would you expect? Describe to me a church where you're seeing evidence of the grace of God. And I think you would see lives that have been transformed. You would have people who worship God with their heart and soul and mind and strength. You would expect to find people who are friends, who are kind. You would expect to see people who are compassionate. Generous people. Goodness sake, if you're sitting next to somebody who you don't know, afterwards, just say welcome. But please, the roof will not fall in. I promise you. And the Lord and the great number of people were brought to the Lord. Huh? Now listen to this. Then Barnabas went to Tartus, Tarsus to look for Saul. He is so impressed by what he's seen at Antioch, evidence of the grace of God, that he says, you know what? I want old Saul to come and see this. Not yet Paul, Saul. So off he goes. <laughs> now, you know, you go, mm, Saul. And he went and he found Saul and he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Imagine, Barnabas, you know, got a home group. Tonight, come along. You know. Oh dear, is it, is it Gray or Jackson? No. <laughs> it's Barnabas or Saul. <laughs> really? Goodness me. You know, that puts a different complexion on it. For a whole year, 12 months, 12 months. You know, you, I tell you, you wouldn't be looking in the village news at you know, 10 o'clock, you know, it, it would, <laughs> you'd be here in a shot, in a shot. Barnabas, this man, this great guy, good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith and soul. You'd just be, I need to go and hear what's happened. And then, and then we read this. And the disciples 
at Antioch were called Christians for the first time. That name appeared, Christians. Christian at Antioch. The very first time that name, so they're not called Christians like after the resurrection. The disciples weren't Christians. You know, that name hadn't been worked up yet. And probably the name Christians was, was a, a derogatory name, a, 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 a mocking name. You, you remember how, 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 you remember during the Second World Lord, Lord Haw Haw, well you wouldn't remember Lord Haw Haw. Lord Haw Haw, who was Lord Haw Haw? William Joyce, the, the, the voice of this propaganda thing, mocking the British, terribly posh. And, they were, and the Australians were holed up in Tobruk in North Africa. And Haw Haw, in one of his broadcasts, referred to the Australians as being holed up in Tobruk like rats. And what was born, born from that? The title? Desert Rats. <laughs> and forever thereafter, it was the badge of honor the Australians loved it. They were never so proud as to be able to say, I am a desert rat. And everybody who went up to North Africa thereafter, your dad, your grandpas, your uncles, whatever, asked, well, they're probably not alive, many of them, but they loved to refer to themselves, I was a desert rat. Have you ever heard that one? I was a desert rat. And do they speak it with pride? Of course they do. Whereas it was a, oh, my goodness, you guys are like rats in the desert, worthy only to be exterminated. <laughs> desert rat. Guys, I'm a desert rat and proud of it. Christians. Oh, they said, what, you know, Christians. Oh, my goodness gracious. And they took it on. <laughs> yep, I'm a Christian, and I ain't ashamed of it either. Christians, and about stuck at Antioch. Acts chapter 11, read about it. And at Antioch, they were first called Christians. And when they said Christians, hey, they were Christians. Truly, not just a name, followers of Jesus, men and women taken hold of by Jesus. They were first called Christians at Antioch. Go home and read it. It is a great story. Just the church at Antioch. And may God make us Christians like that. Us guys, okay, not just the guys. Men, men, Good men, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. That we kind of be men and women who are just reflecting who Jesus is, whose lives have been touched by the transforming power of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.